Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. I think it was Howard Cosell who first referred to sports as the toy department of life. Oftentimes, talk about player performance has been put down to say that it's not rocket science. Well, the fact is that we now know that it's neuroscience, computer science, medical science, and a whole lot more. We often talk about the game of golf as being so much inside the player's head. But now new research shows us that this is just as true for football, basketball, and especially baseball. The metrics that drove Moneyball have now been amplified to include new arenas of scientific data that may be the handicapping tools and tip sheets of the future. We're going to talk about this today with my guest, journalist Zach Schoenbrunn. Zach Schoenbrunn has been a contributing writer for the New York Times since 2011. He's covered primarily sports and business. Six of his articles have appeared on the newspaper's front page, and his work has also appeared in ESPN, the magazine, the Washington Post, Yahoo Sports, Vice, and many other publications. It is my pleasure to welcome Zach Schoenbrunn here to talk about his new book, The Performance Cortex, How Neuroscience is Redefining Athletic Genius. Zach, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jeff. Well, what a lovely intro. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to talk first about the, the new insights that we have and what some of this brain imaging is showing us and whether or not as we look at this imaging and we look at these insights and, and the neuroscience that goes along with it, whether these are things that show early on in an individual the ability to achieve peak performance or are what we are what are we seeing part of the experience that these athletes bring to it, the fact that they've been doing the same thing over and over and over again for so many years. Right. Well, you know, I'll answer the second part of that question first. And, and the, there's no evidence yet that there's any brain that's been born to play sports. That's not to say that there isn't a brain for sports, but it just hasn't been shown yet. But there's plenty of evidence that the brain can change and augment and alter and transform throughout the course of your life, especially in childhood and adolescence. Uh, the brain has demonstrated a lot of plasticity in those periods uh, and much more fertile periods of your life, um, but also throughout uh, adulthood in response to training and experience um, your brain regions that are put to the test in, in, uh, in, in performance or in uh, the tasks that you're trying to train, um, the, uh, the brain regions do respond uh, to that training that you're, that you're going through, and, and they change and transform. This is called neuroplasticity. And so what, what that means is that athletes obviously put in hours and hours and years of training uh, to their craft, and so you would imagine that their brains, if you were to take them into a brain scanner and see what's going on, their regions that are responsible for their performance would reflect those changes differently than perhaps you or I in the scanner. And what's happening now is neuro, a neuroscience company, there's only one so far, and this is the one that I focused on in my book, but they're able to use a neuroimaging technique. It's called EEG or electroencephalography, um, and they're able to see decision-making along a very short temporal time frame, the, this, the time that it takes for a fastball to reach home plate, we're talking milliseconds here, but they're able to pinpoint when decisions are made by a major league or professional hitter to swing or not swing at a pitch. And so this is where kind of that next wave of analytics in sports might be headed is using quantification to not just to, to not just to analyze uh, performance, uh, you know, on the field that we can all see, but actually what's happening inside the heads or underneath the helmets of of baseball hitters. I guess the other part of that is the way in which it may relate to prospects in a particular sport. That can we use that data? Can we ascertain that data? in terms of how fast that decision-making process works, how the information moves within the, the neurosystem to determine who may or may not be better in a particular way. Right. Yeah, there, there are two, two avenues that teams, uh, major league teams, are looking 
at possibly using this decision-making information. One is through training and improvement. Can we see that a guy is responding more quickly perhaps to a fastball than a curveball and then use that information to improve his ability to hit a curveball? It's just more information that a, that a player can use to augment uh, whatever training protocol he's going through and perhaps um, get him better at uh, decision-making at whatever pitch he needs to, to improve. But the other avenue that teams are looking and I think is probably the most uh, has the most potential is what you're talking about scouting and screening for future players and it requires a lot of data to be collected it's going to take time because you need to you need to get a lot of players through to, in order to develop perhaps a baseline for what it takes to be a major league hitter and so if they're able to see that the 300 hitters are all responding to pitches between this window of 350 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds from home plate then maybe you can use that information to potentially even rule out any prospects that they're scouting who don't fit into that window of decision making it might be a little harsh i don't want to say they're going to completely rule out any prospect or or assume that any prospect can't improve that decision making ability but at least they could use that information um to better scout or assess you know the decision making of uh, of prospects and screen for future players so um i think it, it it fits into that this whole analytics uh, environment that we are in sports where more there's just more and more information we're quantifying things that we never thought um, we could quantify and I think it gives teams just another tool another piece of data to use to make better decisions about what players uh, they might want to play I guess areas where it also applies could actually transcend sports if you think about it with respect to Jet pilots, fighter pilots, you know, even this story yesterday about this uh, Southwest pilot that reacted so calmly and so quickly to lots of data and lots of information. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think of you think of the military uh, implications, being able to decide, you know, when to pull the trigger and when not to pull the trigger or for police mm -hmm. or law enforcement or for referees watching the game. There's a lot so many we we often don't appreciate the, the, the decision making and the cognition of the referees being able to see and react to things happening so quickly. So, yeah, there, there are tons of applications right now. There's. You know, it's still very nascent to the technology and the use of it. Um, there's there's certain limitations. Um, you know, motor research and the use of EEG is kind of limited in how much you can actually move around in the equipment, which is funny because, you know, you are trying to conduct uh, research on movement, but you can't actually move yourself <laughs> too much. And so movement tends to corrupt the data. So what they do, at least with the baseball players, is they have them sitting wearing the cap on their heads as they're, as they're in front of a laptop screen screen and they're pushing a button at a laptop uh, you know at a, as a simulated pitch is coming toward them but i think as the technology improves and we start to perhaps get equipment that you can you can wear as you're moving about or wear um, in you know perhaps in a batting cage or or in a cockpit of a plane or something like that I think there's no question that the possibilities uh, are, are they seem pretty limitless uh, to me just in terms of you know the decision making that that all of us make on an everyday basis and I guess the the extension of that is also how to improve upon those numbers how to improve upon that data whether it's by training, whether it's by the proverbial 10,000 hours of experience, or that maybe going forward there is yet another way that we don't yet know or understand to enhance these capabilities. Yeah, it could be, and I think it all comes through, it, it comes from this a different understanding and an appreciation for the role that the brain plays in movement. You know, I've been a sports journalist for my career. Um, I've been a sports fan for even longer than that. And I think sports fans tend to be conditioned to think about athleticism strictly in terms of the physical, the speed, the quickness, the size of their biceps. And, you know, we even have terms that minimize the role that the brain plays in movement. We talk about things like muscle memory, but of course muscles have no memory. They're just muscles. And so what, 
we're talking about is the involvement, actually, the involvement of the brain in sending and organizing uh, signals from from your your head through the rest of your body. And I think until there's a better appreciation and a, and ultimately a better understanding of the way those signals work and the way that they are organized, um, I think you know it, it still could be a little. We're, we're still a little bit limited in how much we can we can improve or know about what could be coming in terms of training and improvement, but I think that first step has to be a realization and a new appreciation um, for cognition and the role that the brain plays in performance. And the other area that, that relates to you know muscle memory is, is just a phrase, but we're learning more and more about things like cellular memory that is definitely brain controlled, and that seems to be a part of this as well. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it, it, it's it's it, it is interesting. I mean, the neurons, you know, neurons are small little. Th- we got eighty six billion of them, and and they're, you know, th- for for a neuron to sit, to send a signal all the way down to your legs or or to your arms, it takes a long time. We don't often appreciate um, the time it takes for movement to transpire, and so for the for this uh, sort of organization and the patterns of our movements to take place, it is is a remarkably intricate and complex system just to reach your arm out uh, to grab a coffee mug at the end of your desk or never mind to walk down the street and and uh, and avoid obstacles and, and make sure you're not stepping into oncoming traffic it is an extraordinary uh, problem for the brain to be solving on an everyday basis we take it for granted because of how natural these things come to us but when you look at an, an extraordinary athlete who moves uh, in the way that they do uh, on the field or on the court. You know, I think it's, it's just that it's another level of uh, cognition and computation uh, and demand on the brain um, that we've just long prescribed and, and given the credit uh, to, uh, to the body. Um, but as one neuroscientist told me, it's like, it's like saying that I speak really, uh, that, I'm, that I'm very fluent in French because I've got a very dexterous tongue. <laughs> it's just the wrong place to assign the credit. Is there a sense that the way the brain organizes some of this information and is more efficient about it in elite athletes, to what extent does that start early on? I mean, is there a connection between some of these elite athletes that you see started literally when they were young children? Right, absolutely, and it gets back to what I was saying about, earlier about the um, plasticity, plasticity of our brain and throughout childhood and adolescence, the brain is particularly fertile to change and augmentation, and brain regions are developing in in, in ways that are, that it doesn't quite go away in adulthood, but it does seem to kind of you know harden or solidify uh, as we as we get older. That doesn't mean that the brain is incapable of further change, but it just takes more time and effort. And so the great example is uh, it, it, to understand this a little better is Michael Jordan. Okay, Michael Jordan was this world-class basketball player, but yet when he tried to play baseball uh, for that one fateful year in 1994, he was terrible and, and much worse than we ever expected. And the reason is that he had played baseball as a kid and had been had been fairly good at baseball, but then he stopped and he and he he. Uh, obviously concentrated on his on his basketball playing and when he tried to pick it up again his ability his brain uh, his brain's ability to pick that skill up again had effectively been lost now if he had continued at baseball uh, you know it's hard to say uh, that he would not have progressed and improved and gotten better it just would have taken a lot more time than he expected and he was willing to put into it so you know jordan's a great example of somebody who we we think of a world-class athlete and the athleticism and air jordan but for base for for a sport like baseball where it comes down to your decision making his brain didn't have the capability to be able to hit a pitch uh, the way that we probably expected him to be able to. Talk about this as it relates to golf, a sport that I think everybody realizes is so much inside one's head as opposed to being, you know, just the physical prowess. Right, right. 
Yeah, so so golf is 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 a bit different because it's not it's it's more of a static sport as, as opposed to baseball, obviously, where you have to judge an incoming pitch at a high velocity um, and and make a split second decision. Golf is much more a game about structure and form and coordination and uh, making sure that your muscles are aligned in the, in, in in the right place at the right time to be able to hit the ball the, in the direction that you want it. But the I, that idea that hitters spend so much time building that quote unquote muscle memory, it, what it effectively does is it establishes a foundation for their movement, for them, for their brain to be able to say, okay, we have the movement down to be able to hit the ball, and now we can we can um, we can sit, we can uh, focus from this point on on strategizing, on cognition, on, on thinking through what we're about to do rather than having to think through the motion of the swing. A novice, as we're, we're just picking up the game, we're thinking about our swing, we're thinking about our form, our technique, and that effectively, it, uh, it limits our ability to actually perform the action. It involves brain regions that otherwise would not be uh, involved if we were an expert. Experts are able to quiet those more th- those thinking through the motions regions of the brain that might be involved and they're otherwise uh, activating regions that are involved in strategizing and thinking about their next shot and, and focusing on um, what exactly it takes to, to excel at, the, at that hole. And so it, it's just kind of, you know, you're delving into a bit of the psychology there. I think there's, there's, um, it, it is a bit blurry when you're talking mm-hmm. about what's neuroscience and what's psychology. I think all these things are interrelated. Um, but, um, Golf, golf and baseball are, are, are two, two very different uh, problems for the brain to try and master. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about the two guys that, that you write a lot about in their company that really is at the cutting edge of all of this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I discovered them. Well, actually, I should I should give proper credit to my wife. My wife was the one who discovered them, uh, reading a little blurb about them in in an alumni magazine. And at the time, they were uh, neuro they were neuroscience uh, students, doctoral students at Columbia University, and they were doing research into decision making in hitters. And they had started this company called Deservo, uh, based here in New York, and and they were starting to use that information uh, to inf- better inform. Uh, major league teams about what it takes to decide on an incoming pitch and and they were using a neuroimaging device the EEG um, and they're the only company today still that is using EEG with professional athletes and what that could tell them is it it could it could delineate the millisecond that a mo- that a hitter decides to swing or not swing at a pitch and of course we can always tell when a hitter decides to swing at a pitch because he moves, he swings, right? But we never had information about when a hitter actively decided not to swing. That is, a, that is a, It's the same type of decision. It's still the same neural activation. It's just a different motor output. And so it, it revealed uh, to major league teams this, this new uh, area of mental uh, analytics and, and this opportunity to figure out, you know, wh- wh- what, is the, what is the decision making that these, that these hitters uh, are, are making. And, um, and yeah, so they've been working with major league teams for uh, three or four years now, and I've been following them every step of the way. How much of a difference, if at all, has it made in, in terms of assessing players and understanding what they're capable of? Yeah, so it's a little hard to, to say. It's still very nascent and, and, and early on um, in this understanding. I think there's a healthy curiosity from teams at this point. The Servo has spoken uh, with, uh, or at least corresponded with 28 of the 30 teams. There's plenty of interest, and they have signed uh, consulting agreements with about 10 of them so far, including a team in, in Korea. And there's still, it's still very early, and, and, and more, as I was saying earlier, a lot more data needs to be collected. They need to put uh, more players uh, through this scanning device, the limitation here and the burden that uh, De Servo has been um, up against is that it's it's a fairly rigorous scientific approach. At least that's that what they've tried to make it 
as, as rigorous and, and valid as possible. And so it's about a 40-minute assessment of just wearing an EEG head cap and sitting at a laptop and tapping your finger and not being able to move too much. And you can imagine, you know, 18-year-old baseball prospects, they don't want to do that too often. And teams are very wary about burdening their players um, from, uh, you know, overburdening their players with all this extracurricular stuff, especially if it's not clear yet what benefit they're going to get out of it. Uh, I think down the road they're, they are going to be able to get a, a great amount of benefit out of it, but it still takes time for them to be fully convinced about that stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22 there. You need to have a lot of players signed up, but at the same time um, teams don't want to put so many players through until they're convinced uh, that, uh, that the technology works. But, you know, I, I from, from my standpoint, I'm convinced that this – sort of technology, this technique, and neuroscience in general is going to uh, be the future and be incorporated much more in sports as we move forward. How much are things like vision being incorporated? I mean, that's part of the whole neurosystem and through the optic nerves, but that's an important part of it, particularly in something like baseball. How much is that taken into account? How much data is there to, to really define that at this point? Yeah, I mean, you know, this decision is, is of, of course, important. What they've found is, is really that most baseball players have uh, have excellent vision. I mean, you, you kind of there's there's sort of a, a baseline for, for for the type of vision that you can that you need to have in order to be a major league baseball player. And so, a lot of baseball players um, do have a, a great visual acuity. And certainly, there there might be slight differences, and I think there is an effort to understand what those differences might be um, but if you if you were to take you know across the board I think you would you would see most uh, baseball players fit in this uh, range of about 2010 to 2012 visual acuity and of course not every baseball player is an all-star and so figuring out there you know there probably is something else going on that contributes to their uh, success right. and and it certainly is not um, at least you know, from from my own vantage point, it does not seem to have anything to do with the size of their muscles or just the size of their physiques in general. You look at the uh, two uh, leaders for the American League MVP race last year; they couldn't look any more physically different from each other. It was five foot five Jose Altuve and the six foot seven Aaron Judge from the New York Yankees, and and they were uh, the two best hitters in the league. So you know, we can see what their differences are. What is it that relates them? I think that's the question that neuroscience might be able to right. answer. Right. I mean, the part of that, and we've all heard players say so often, you know, I'm seeing the ball well lately. You know, they're on a hitting streak, and, you know, they're asked why. I'm seeing the ball well. Well, what does that mean in the context of, of, of neuroscience and the context of, of what these guys are trying to figure out? Right, right. Well, you know, we often think about uh, athletes in fast-moving sports like baseball or tennis as being reaction machines, just see ball, hit ball. But actually, that really couldn't be further from the truth. Our body systems, our, our motor system, doesn't work fast enough in order to respond just by the feedback of seeing an incoming pitch or an incoming tennis serve at 150 miles an hour and deciding then to swing. We have to use prediction uh, and, and pick up on cues that experts have been very, very good at establishing over the course of their careers and all the practice and the time that they put into it. Oftentimes, these cues are, are they're almost, I hate to say they're imperceptible because there's something that these experts are picking up on, but they would be imperceptible to you or I or a baseball fan. And it's, and it's actually something that uh, triggers a motor activation in their, in their brains that would be different uh, than a lay person just watching the game uh, from the sidelines. And I'll give you a, an, an amazing example. There was a study a few years ago out of Rome involving some professional basketball players for an Italian elite professional basketball league. And they took these players and they showed them a video of a guy shooting a free throw. And they stopped the clip as soon as the ball left the man's fingertips and they, they focused just strictly on, on his hand movement and his, and his arm movement. And, and they stopped the, the clip just as the moment the ball left his fingertips. And they asked the players to judge whether or not the ball went in the basket. And they, they also tested coaches and they tested 
other retired players. They tested other journalists and fans or bloggers, people who watch basketball all the time. And they found demonstrably that the, the players that were actively involved in the game were much more accurate at guessing whether the ball went in the basket or not. And the reason they think is there's something about their perception of that image. The, uh, their, their, the cues that they are picking up is in some ways triggering motor areas and effects. They can simulate the feeling of their own ball, leaving their own fingertips, mm. and judge whether or not they would feel like that ball is going to go in or not. And so this link between perception and action is much stronger than we often uh, realize. And the more practice and energy and uh, experience that we actively put into something, we are constantly strengthening that our, our ability to perceive. Well, what is the role, if any, of, of using things like video games and virtual reality as a way to push some of these theories and test them out? Yeah, well, you know, brain gaming and, and cognitive training is, is obviously a growing industry. And, you know, one of the things that I liked about DeServo, or at least that, I, that caught my eye about DeServo, is they were, were very clear that they uh, initially, when they got started, they were, they were not a brain gaming company. They did not promise any, uh, you know, performance enhancement or, or uh, training benefits. They were simply saying, we can provide you information. You can choose to do with it what you want. And the, the, the kind of the reason that they decided to separate themselves that way is that there has been a lot of pushback uh, in recent years against some of the cognitive training uh, methods like the Lumosities um, who have who are actually fined for deceptive marketing and some of the things that they were advertising about uh, what their games could offer. And what it comes down to is there's just no evidence, uh, at least to this point, that you can play a video game um, in a, a, a sort of video game that might not have anything to do with what you're actually training. Let's say like a game like Tetris. A lot of these brain gaming companies like Lumosity, they'll give you a game like Tetris and they'll say this will improve your strategizing and your decision making and so on. But there's no evidence actually that that transfers to your ability to improve on the field, and uh, and so some of that stuff can be can be very deceptive, um, and you know, but but brain gaming, if you are actively playing something that it does correlate to the uh, to the game that you're trying to master, um, whether it's a baseball game in which you're seeing an incoming pitch or a football game where you're reading the screen. And this is where virtual reality, I think, um, can also have a big impact because you're, you're able to move with the, mach with the simulation and you're able to experience. Those things are much more uh, there's much more movement fidelity is what you're looking for. And, uh, and so, move, you know, in order to get any sort of benefit, you have to be um, in the environment or at least simulating the environment that your brain is preparing to face. And so, uh, you know, avoid the, the games that are all about the Tetris <laughs> and the, the quote-unquote strategizing. And if you're going to do any sort of video gaming or uh, brain gaming, Focus on those that are actually putting you in the scenario that you're trying to test. I mean, listen, we've had we we know the success of flight simulators and there, you know, and 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 things like that for uh, preparing a pilot to to experience what he's about to experience. For some reason, you know, sports has been a little bit slower at producing these types of of simulated games um, to to practice. But you know, and 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 all this being said the best practice that you can do for your brain is actually going out and practicing in the scenarios and then the, getting the experience um, in, in reality <laughs> rather than virtual reality. I don't think there's, there's any uh, making up for that experience. And finally, Zach, talk a little bit about data and, and big data and the importance of these guys at, at DeServo collecting more and more data and how that will be a key to, to what happens in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, you, do, you just you, you never want to uh, make to rush to any judgment, uh, especially about a prospect or or a um, or a future player uh, w without without enough information, especially when you're talking about something as elemental as decision making. And I think um, you know, it's just it's going to take time. And and the problem is that sports 
uh, tends to be, for especially professional sports, they t- it tends to be an impatient industry. It's what can you do for me now, and and uh, you know can your can you help my team win now? And I think you know the the uh, the issue there would be if, if God forbid if if you tried to make an assessment about a player about the baseline that it takes to be a professional hitter in the decision making window that we were talking about earlier, and then uh, you know throwing out any prospects that don't fit into that window because you know um, it, it should be on just another uh, piece of information another uh, analytical uh, method um, to perhaps analyze or screen uh, for future future players I, I think that um, there's there's still need for a lot more data a lot more uh, information to be collected about uh, about these the brains of, of these hitters before we rush to any judgments about how good somebody is going to be based on on their decision making alone Zach Schoenbrunn, his book is The Performance Cortex, How Neuroscience is Redefining Athletic Genius. Zach, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Ah, great to be here, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.